Ikui and Akese, all located to the west and northwest of modern Ilori and Tumosho. Based on the research carried out by Robin Law, an authority on the Old Oil Kingdom, working off traditions collected by Johnson between the 1860s and 1890s, and other scholarly attempts at establishing a chronology of the Yorubawas, thinks these battles, in this case in northern Yoruba land, were fought between 1831 and 1833. The other war was in the south, fought around 1833, during which Oyo forces seized Ibadan, the biggest city in Yoruba land today, and resulted in the final destruction of Uwu. To date, I have found only one reference to the Chumacho in published documents or contemporary sources. In 1839, a Paris-based French anthropologist, Mary Dazebat Makaya, met and interviewed Oshifa Kude and Jebuyo Rubaste, who has traveled to Paris in around 1836 or 1837 with his French master of traveling him from Rio de Janeiro. Oshifa Kude's Brazilian name was Joaquim, but in France it was called sometimes Joseph. The conversation took place over several months, between 1839 and 1840, even after the master had returned to, to Brazil. The guy remained um, in Paris. The public, so the materials were published in 1845 after Shifa had returned to Brazil. In the geographical section of the essay, for instance, we learned that traveling, and this is from Oshifa Kode, is not contemporary to this particular war. Tells us that, for instance, traveling north from Ikorodo, and I think I'm going to, uh, yeah, that's the map. So Ikorodo is right there. That's Ikorodo right there. Oh, I'm sorry. That's Ikorodo right there that traveling north from Ikorodo on the Lagos Lagoon, and I'm quoting, a very long day's journey, that's about 50 miles, brings us to one Remo, the dependency of Ijebo. It first time is Igori, and so just look at the map, and this is Ikorodo, so it keeps moving north. Still further, four or five hours, so that's like eight to 10 miles, brings us to what he calls a komocho, but here he describes a komocho as an oyotan, three days from Kumbu. Again, that's Ijebugo, which is, again, right, that's Ijebugo right there. And beyond, and this is the important thing, beyond a komocho is Akumu. Again, that we know very well, that's Akumu right there. An important market town which belongs to the brother of the king of Jebu, that's the king of Ife. In 1967, a British sociologist, Pena Lloyd, identifies a Kumocho with Ogumosho, so given the way it sounds, he thinks the name must have been uh, Ogumosho. And that the journey must have been due north, so he assumes that Oshife Kudu was basically describing a north-south direct uh, trade route. But this is a mistake, because Lord ignores Shita Kude's claim, first that a Komocho was shortly after Eba and before Akumi, not beyond. It's before, not beyond. Second, Oshita Kude also places a Komocho very close to what he calls River Osho. Again, I'm quoting Oshifa Kudin. Many but inconsiderable rivers water and fertilize this territory. That territory to him, that's what's in Jebu. The most important is Osho, which comes from a great distance in Oyo country, where it is called Isheri. It is already a large stream at a Komocho, and too large to be forded at Ibo. It crosses Remo and empties its waters into Kurudu Lagoon. 
why Lloyd again reads a commercial as a commercial, he concedes that, I'm quoting him, this description of the causes of major refers is very modern. It is the Ogo which rises in your country, and that's River Ogo right there, and that's River Ogo. The rises in the your country and merges into the lagoon near Ikorodo. The ocean rises beyond Oshobo, and that's Oshobo there. Passing 20 miles east of Ibadan to reach the lagoon near Ekwe. I agree with Lloyd, but think the modeling was probably on Makaya's part, who misunderstood what Oshifa Kude said in Creole Portuguese, but with a very thick Jebu accent. Certain things got lost in translation, and I'm going to expand on that. The reference to Isheri must have been to River Ogo, which rises in your country, where some people, especially around Lagos, calls it Isheri. It seems implausible also that Oshifa Kude would jump from Akum to Bumosho thus leaving out such big towns as Ede and Iwo, and these are you know, big cities um, right there, before you get to Bumosho, big cities in this area. Both big trade towns on the Bumosho road. My argument, therefore, is to concentrate the search for Tumacho in southern Yoruba land, where Oshifa Kudim was very well. And again, for this map, I'm thinking of Henry Lovejoy, I mean, mm -hmm. who is basically the, one of the leading you know, cartographers of African history today. As violence associated with the slave trade ravaged northern Yoruba land, refugees, traders, soldiers of fortune, bandits poured into the southern forest. Political instability in Oyo Kingdom redirected trade route territories. One such route passed from Lupe to Elori, connecting Owo. So what I'm saying is, with violence in northern Yoruba land in the early 19th century, the trade route which in the 18th century moved straight from the north towards sort of western Oyo and reaching the coast at Badagri, at Portunobo, that trade route you know, forced to push eastwards. The major market on this eastern route was Akwum, and if at which slaves were sold to Jebu traders in exchange for calories, weapons, foodstuffs, textiles, tobacco, amongst others. Firearms became an important commodity after 1820. Development around Akmo raised an urgent need for the control of this trade route, both for its commercial value but also for the security of traders. Competition for the control of this market intensified among surrounding states, Ife, Ijebu, Egba, Oyo, but specifically and Owo. And this led to two quick wars, first in 1811-1812, second in 1817-1822, which led to the collapse of the <coughs> bulk of Owo. And one quick, let me just show you uh, through Google Maps what we what I'm talking about today. Now, the old Owo where we destroyed, that's what now calls the Ago Owo Reserve. Where the battles were destroyed in the 1820s, that's when we now have this huge, again, forest reserve. So the search for the commercial is focused on this region. That's Oshawa right there. That's modern Ibadan. After the first and second war wars, a group of Ijebu, Oyo, and Ife soldiers occupied Ibadan and Ibadan and put it under the control of an Ife led military council. <coughs> From here, they launched periodic trains into neighboring districts. At Ibadan, old divisions persisted among the Confederacy as evident in the partitioning of new settlements into ethnic-based wards or colors, each led by a senior military officer. 
Thus, the Oyo and Ife occupied the central districts of modern Ibano. The Jebu occupies the old southern west parts of the, of the city. Old ethnic and communal and often personal divisions lasted on, sometimes degenerating into mutual hatred. Indeed, it appears the only thing uniting this group was their common love for warfare and their position towards the Egwa and the Umbu. Based on your traditions, the allies, sorry, based on your traditions, in 1830, a civil conflict began in Ibadan, pitching the largely, or your, in this case, the demographic or majority against the Ife led council. Based on your traditions, the Oyo and Wu group drew the first blood by raiding and kidnapping Oyo group, Oyo people. Johnson, for instance, thinks the initial skirmishes lasted nearly a whole year. And I'm going to, uh, yeah, that's basically I'm sort of talking about some of these wars right now, the conflicts during this period. Other traditions remembers two pitched battles. The first called Banamu, that is grasping fire, aimed after the fighting tactic because it was a battle where courage and valor proved decisive. For the battle forces, it was a life and death struggle, a fight in which swordsmen proved themselves a match for those with firearm. Rushing upon their assailants, sword in hand, and grasping the barrel of the gun. The battle averted the fatal discharge of the weapons while using their swords and machetes with effect. The battlefield is now called Banamu, which is now a farm between Ideshu and Kodo in southwest Ibadan. And during this last summer, I traveled some of, some of those uh, villages. Now it's a huge uh, farm. With victory at Banamu, Oyo forces turned against the remnants of Owo forces barricaded at Erowo, the last Owo time to fall. And again, this is very interesting because studies so far on the Owo war tend to tell us that the last Owo war ended in 1822. 1822. But given these wars and after effects and retaliations, the war seems to have actually dragged out into the early 1830s. Now we have, yesterday there was a question on, in terms of anecdotes. Now we have two, I mean three of such. Uh, the first was that the war took place shortly before the corn harvest. And I'm describing them. Corn planted within the walls of Eremo were yet to mature. And because of hunger, Ogu people had no choice but to eat or ripe corn. Let me just drop quickly. The arrival of the two mature slaves in Cuba most probably resulted from this war. How do we know? First, we have seen above that Oshifa Kunde placed a Komocho between Egwa and Akumu and near the Shoriba. The description puts a Komocho within Old Ogo Kingdom. Oshifa Kunde can be supplemented by at least one other near contemporary source, Samuel Johnson. The historian of Yoruba who grew up in Ibadan and who collected oral traditions from about the 1870s through the 1890s. And he writes with reference to this war. The Jebus now declared war against Owo and crossing the Osho River and camped at the farm of one Osho, which in Yoruba again they will render as Oko Esho. Is Oko Esho the same as Uchimacho? Perhaps my research will show this. Just quickly. Further, the demography of the first 77 slaves, I'm sorry, liberated from the slave from the ship shows reveal some interesting patterns. There were 412 adult male and 65 female. 379 adult males, 98 children. The children consisted of 29 girls, 69 boys, and the adults were 343 adult male and 36 women. The oldest woman was only 21. 
the age breakdown becomes even more fascinating. The youngest, can I get just one more minute? Mm -hmm. One more minute. Okay. Thank you. The youngest slaves on board were three 10 year old girls. There were 11 children, all aged 11. 27 were 12 years, 49 were 13 years, and 18 were 14. 49 were between 15 and 90 years. There were 206 slaves in their 20s, um, 19 in their 30s, and only two were above 40. One was 47, the other was 48. This demographic structure relates closely to some of the features of Yoruba wars. Adult males typically formed the bulk of the military and but also from the bulk of victims because women would have left town before such pitched battles. The fact that no child was less than 10 years and no woman was beyond 21 years suggests that older and nursing mothers had left town before this group were enslaved. Moreover, the preponderance of adult males who are the natural soldiers including the large number of boys in their late teens. We do know from Krada, for instance, that age 13, where his town was attacked in 1821, he joined the militia, even though he was underage, I mean, given today's standard. Another clue, the names of slaves freed from this vessel. How many Yoruba names, and how many, I was looking for sort of some patterns, how many Yoruba names and how many names could be placed with specific Yoruba regions? Of the first 77 slaves freed, 428, that is 89.7, had clearly identifiable Yoruba names. Six had Muslim names, um, four of which could be found amongst Yoruba Muslims. Like yesterday, Ogugo talked about the Bashir and Bashir how the houses would say Bashir, and the Yoruba would say Bashir. And again, with these names, you could see the pronunciation that even though these were Muslim names, they were, not, they were pronounced in ways different from the way an Hausa or Kanonida would render it. One assumption is that if these people had come from Northern Yoruba land, that is, if they had been from Ubumosho, I would not expect them to have come from the same place. The distance was justifiable to have this group to reach the court in that same single or monolithic uh, ethnic composition. As mentioned above, the 1833 war near Bumosha was fought between Oyo and Ilori forces. So in the names, I was looking for Muslim names, for names peculiar to Northern Yoruba land. But also, I was expecting to see fewer Ijebu or because these are some of the southern Yoruba districts. Therefore, in my search, I looked for Muslim names and certain provincial uh, names. With this lacking, the fact again points towards South Central Yoruba land, where we see more representations of Pan Yoruba. By Pan Yoruba, I'm using that loosely, that is, names that sort of cut across the Yoruba speaking region. It is also not for traders that it is here in the central region, we have the city, the city called Ilefe, where all the Yorubas claim to have come from. There is also a correlation between the movement of the Manuelita and the Banamu El War. Based on Johnson's oral traditions, the itinerary shows that it left Cuba in June 1833. So, most have reached West Africa not later than late August to early September 1833. So, no, give and take two to three <coughs> And probably stay off the coast for a long time. I'm sort of like called on when the slaves arrived. From oral traditions, we are told the war was fought shortly before the harvest season. Based on Yoruba agricultural calendar, there are only two corn harvest seasons. The first coincides with the early rain, March to June, and the second from August to October, or oh, sorry, August to November. 
if we accept the tradition that Owu people ate on ripe corn, that is when shortly before the corn harvest, it seems plausible that the harvest coupled with the fact that the Manolita left Lagos on October 30, we might place the fall of the commercial in between late September and early October 1833. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Junji. And thanks for giving me time. In hindsight, it now appears that Junji's paper should have gone first. And Richard's coming second. Tunji's uh, paper didn't win. The uh, origins of these captures uh, who ended up uh, uh, captured, in captures, you know, ended up getting into ships that then were captured. And uh, Richard's dealing with the resettlement in Sierra Leone. Um, but of course, now those who were here when the two papers were presented. Uh, and still connected that. Uh, we will take questions. And Junji uh, uh, and Richard, if you feel like you want to walk up all the way there to answer the questions, please do so. Okay. All right. Uh,